Hello, our amazing listeners of Neuro Careers doing the impossible. It's your podcast host, Dr. Milena Krastenskaya, or simply Dr. K. And I'm excited to welcome you to the second season of our podcast, Exploring Entrepreneurial Careers in Neuroscience and Neurotechnologies. Have you ever wondered what it takes to transform brain science into groundbreaking products and services? Are you curious about the fearless visionaries who bridge the gap between neuroscience and entrepreneurship to change people's lives and reshape our world? Are you ready to explore how to navigate the uncharted waters of neurotech entrepreneurship? In season two, we are diving deep into the world of entrepreneurial ventures in neuroscience and neurotechnologies. If you are looking to create an immediate impact and translate your neuroscience and neurotech ideas into innovative services that truly make a difference in the world, this season is tailor-made for you. Join us and learn from the best in the field about succeeding in the entrepreneurial journey in neuroscience and neurotechnology where innovation meets impact. We've got an incredible lineup of guests who have not only shaped their careers, but have also made a profound impact on the field. Throughout this season, we'll explore the captivating stories of visionaries who've risen to the challenge, who've turned obstacles into opportunities, and who've innovated in ways that are changing the landscape of neuro careers. So, whether you are a seasoned professional in the field, an inspiring entrepreneur, or simply curious about the intersection of science and business in this ever-evolving arena, the season promises inspiration, education, and a glimpse into the exciting future of neuro careers. I am Dr. Milena Krastenska, the founder of the Institute of Neuro Approaches, where I help people establish successful careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies through career coaching and education. So let's dive into the entrepreneurial journeys that are shaping the future of neuroscience and neurotechnologies together. Tune in now into the thrilling episode number 72. Welcome, dear listeners, to another inspiring episode of Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible Entrepreneurial Podcast Series. Today, we are joined by a guest who is reshaping the landscape of neurotechnology and entrepreneurship. Imagine a world where individuals suffering from paralysis and ALS have access to affordable and groundbreaking brain-computer interface solutions. Well, our guest is at the forefront of making that vision a reality. Meet Ariane Govill, a fourth-year undergraduate student studying neuroscience at New York University and the founder of Synaptrix Labs. Arian is on a mission to create low-cost brain-computer interface solutions that empower patients with paralysis to regain their independence. At Synaptrix Labs, their flagship innovation, Neuralis, is a mind-controlled wheelchair that utilizes EEG electrodes and a headband headset to detect a user's intention, allowing intuitive wheelchair navigation. This technology has the potential to change the lives of individuals with conditions like ALS and locked-in syndrome. Arian's journey is a testament to the power of combining a passion for neuroscience with entrepreneurial spirit. With a strong background in medical research, including projects related to Alzheimer's disease, Ariane is committed to improving the lives of those in need. A welcome, Ariane. It's a great pleasure to have you today on our podcast. Thank you very much for joining us. And can you tell our listeners where you are joining us from, from what part 
of the world today. Yeah, and of course, Melina, thank you so much for having me today. It's a real pleasure. I wasn't your podcast for a while now, and our, and our team loves the work you've done uh, in the neurotech community. I'm currently in my apartment in New York City. I study here, I work here, uh, and I plan to grow my company here. As well. oh, wonderful. And uh, can you tell our listeners about the university you are attending? So it's New York University. Because as you know, our listeners are joining us from different parts of the world. And it's nice to hear about the universities where such an amazing things like you do are taking place. Mm -hmm. So I studied in honors neuroscience at New York University. It's a leading research institution in America, right in the heart of New York City. You know, I currently work both at the Center for Neuroscience at the undergraduate university, as well as the medical school up at Langone Health. And it's an incredible university that has a strong focus in many fields of neuroscience, including neurotech, which we're in, but also Alzheimer's disease clinical trials, which it pours billions of dollars in every year to try to find a solution. My journey at NYU actually started with Alzheimer's disease clinical trials, where, where I, I led a few efforts in the neuroimaging world with radiology and image segmentation. And, and slowly, I kind of found my way uh, to bring computer interfaces. And it's, it's been great to have a support of a great institution like NYU, who's actually even sponsored a few grants for Synaptrics in the past. Um, and it's a pleasure to be a student here and working here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your introduction. And can you take a step back and bring us to the time when you made the decision to study neuroscience? When was it and how did it happen? What motivated you to get on this amazing journey? Yeah, so it was eight years ago. I, I just got into high school and I needed a place to volunteer. You know, in, in America, generally, when people go to high school, they need volunteer hours. So people try and find uh, places they can help out in their community. And I chose a senior home that's specialized in dementia and Alzheimer's care. And I worked there for about a year and with patients. And, you know, I play piano myself, self-taught. So I play piano for these patients and play games and crossword puzzles and, and chess and and really try to help these patients who who suffer from a horrible, horrible condition. It's a solution that's that's vitally needed. And, you know, I kind of realized early on, eight years ago in high school, that I kind of want to dedicate my life to finding a solution for Alzheimer's or for other neurological conditions as well. And I knew from ninth grade in high school, eight years ago, that I was going to study neuroscience. I was going to do research. And I was going to find a solution for these for these illnesses. Yeah. And uh, why did you choose uh, this particular university, this particular program? Uh, can you uh, mm. talk about your choice? Yeah, a lot of reasons. You know, New York University, both at the undergraduate university and at the medical school, again, like I said, leads Alzheimer's research throughout the world. It, it sets a clear example in what good Alzheimer's research looks like. And they also are not scared of utilizing different techniques, both in imaging and assessment. They really just give you money and, and experience in the lab space to kind of to take an idea and run with it and really help a large uh, population of patients, which we, of course, have here in New York City. As I said, I play piano, I play drums, I love music, and, and New York City is the place to be for that for that thing. So you're going to jazz shows, you're going to Carnegie Hall or New York Philharmonic and, and listening to classical symphonies and operas. It's also great to have that here in New York City. So I knew that NYU was a perfect institution for me when I was in high school, and it's a great choice that I've made. I don't regret it at all. Absolutely. Of course, you were studying. And at the same time, you decided to start your own entrepreneurial venture. Can you tell our listeners about that? How did this happen? Yeah, as people know, a big focus on, on research in academia is to publish papers. It's a big prestige to get your paper published in any journal, you know. And, but, you know, as a student, it, it was frustrating that the point of research was to publish papers instead of getting new technologies or therapeutics into the hands of patients. Not that that doesn't happen eventually, but that wasn't the primary focus. And, and so I knew I wanted to build something special in neurotechnology and brain computer interfaces. And I wanted the main focus of that company, of that vision to be to serve patients from the very start. So, you know, that goes early into the design process, meaning when we had a solution in mind for Neuralis, our, our first product, 
you know, we visited patients at Columbia University and NYU's medical school. We talked to them, what are, what are your current problems with the devices you use currently? How can we fix that with neurotechnology? And then week by week, we went back to those same patients and we, we made these changes. What do you think? Next week, we made these changes based on your feedback. What do you think? What could we do better? And we talked to the doctors that these patients go to. We talked to these patients right from the start because ultimately we would be serving these patients. These devices are supposed to be helping these patients. So there's no reason they shouldn't be part of that process to begin with. And I, I think this is fundamentally different than how research is conducted today. You know, we don't have explicit plans to publish research. Eventually, of course, we would publish our research and our algorithms and our findings. But right now, we're so focused on helping patients. And I think it's it's remarkable. Yeah. So who are your patients that you are trying to help? Yeah. So Synaptrix focuses on patients who suffer from paralysis, quadriplegia. It's a total loss of four limbs. And these patients generally have conditions like ALS, spinal cord injury, strokes, muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, multiple sclerosis and many conditions completely debilitating that lead to a total loss of four limbs and, and these are the patients that we want to help it, you know it, it's a it's a big loss on on everyday quality of life when when patients can't do things that you know mean you can do you know if we if you, we interviewed many patients before so we started synaptrix and, and the number one thing they said they'd like to do is scratch their nose that's what they miss uh, precondition you know and that that broke my heart yeah, it's not right. You know, these patients should not feel trapped in their body. They shouldn't be ashamed of their condition. There have to be better solutions made for these patients. And, and so that's kind of one of the reasons I started Synaldrix. Yeah. Can you maybe give us a background of what's currently available for this patient so that we can see what are you bringing with your company that can solve? This? Yeah. So most patients use a computer vision-based system. So a popular one, for example, is a company called iDays. So it's a big 14 inch monitor that's right in front of the patient's face. And there's like three or four cameras at the bottom of the screen for calibration and for, for eye detection. And, you know, depending on where on the screen they look, the wheelchair will do different things. Um, this is problematic for many reasons. One, because imagine trying to have a conversation with that person. You can't talk to that person when they have a big screen in their face and they, they can't talk to you either. It's a computer vision based system. So you're, capturing eye movement, eye saccades to try to move a wheelchair or prosthetic limb. It's not the most accurate. It's good, but it's not the best. It struggles in certain lighting conditions. For example, in rooms lit by fluorescent light, the algorithms struggle. The cameras also utilize an infrared camera. And if you stare at an infrared camera for long enough, your eyes become dry, they become itchy and puffy. So patients don't like to use these systems. They do not want to use them. It's They use it because it's the option that's available and it's covered by insurance. So they'll they'll get it but it, it's not ideal there are other solutions like a sip and puff method where the patient puts a straw in their mouth and depending on how hard or soft they they suck on that straw or, or blow on that straw the wheelchair can do different things i think it's completely ridiculous i don't know no patient wants to put a straw in their mouth throughout the entire day to move the wheelchair um, and again they use them because they work but that does not mean those are the best solutions and i said as someone with a deep background in neuroscience and brain computer interfaces and machine learning and AI, what can I do different? And so I said, why don't we just take the signal straight from the brain? And that's kind of the founding thesis behind most of neurotech, right? Uh, it's a romantic idea. We take, we take information straight from the brain and control our world with it. And uh, our team at Synaptrix believes our solution is better. It's more accurate, safer. It has fast responsiveness. It's more intuitive. It's socially discreet. There's no screen. It's a simple headband that goes around the back of your head and, and, and patients love it. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start with signals. So what type of signals are you recording? So the Neural's headset specifically lets us signals from the occipital lobe. So we record from actually only three signals, O1, O2, and OZ. And um, we have ground and reference electrodes at, at both temporal sides. Uh, but actually, most of the ingenuity of Neuralis comes from the recording of only three electrodes. And with our proprietary AI model, we can decode those signals and produce patient intent, which has never been done before in the way that we do it with high classification accuracy and the, the, the response speed. It's incredibly exciting. Yeah. Can you maybe provide a comparison what's available again in this domain and how your approach is different from what's available in the field? First, I should clarify that according to the FDA, 
no brain computer interface has ever been approved for wheelchair control. That's one thing that people should keep in mind is that for mechanisms like this to be approved by the government, by the FDA, and in our case in the United States, we really have to, we have to prove that our device doesn't produce false positives. So for example, if the patient is on a curb at the edge of traffic, that patient's wheelchair should not drive into the cars, into traffic. And so can we 100% prove that that will not happen? And generally in the world of brain-computer interfaces, it's hard to prove complete absolutes, complete 100%. Again, our clever AI model we call Saffron, we can do that. We can provide that proof to the FDA and, and we'll actually be the first in the space to be approved in a few months. Oh, that's, that's amazing. So what makes it different? What do you do differently than anybody else? Yeah, so I knew a year and a half ago when I started Synaptics Labs and we, we had to uh, create an EG device that we had to think everything through from the start. So that's detection, denoising, which is a big problem, and feature extraction. Um, so me and my roommate, our CTO, who, who who I asked to help me on this project, is an incredible machine learning engineer. We developed something called Saffron. And Saffron is an acronym for the Synaptrix Accessibility Framework for Rehabilitation and Occupational Neurotech. It's the most capable AI model for EEG signal detection, signal denoising, both on the machine and spatial aspects, as well as feature extraction. So when a patient wants to do something, it really knows that it wants to do something. And... Uh, it has been a long development process just on the software side. Uh, it took us about a year before we started thinking about wheelchairs or device implementations or headsets. Mm -hmm. uh, but just getting the software right was incredibly difficult and required a little bit of new math and you know, made possible through really cheap machine learning architectures that we now have access to in the last four to five years. Mm -hmm. uh, we were really able to make this model and, and now we're integrating into a, 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 you know, a specific uh, device that patients can actually use and, and control their own wheelchairs, whether it be a permobile wheelchair, Quantum, Invacare, Sunrise Medical, it doesn't matter what wheelchair they have, they can use Neuralis on it. And, and we're, we're starting to build that implementation soon. Mm -hmm. What type of EEG signals are you using? Because we know some people might be using steady state developed responses. Yes, some people, uh, P300 potential probably not the best, not the best in your case. Um, so what, what are you looking at? Yeah, so we're, we're ultimately looking at visually evoked potentials. So the idea is the patient will have their smartphone just mounted to the armrest of their phone, and we have an intuitive app, um, Android and iOS, that um, will connect to the headphone, connect to our cloud computing server, and um, ultimately also connect to the wheelchair. And through this intuitive UI that our team has built, we, we are looking for those visually evoked potential signals, depending on where they look on a smartphone. Um, and we can get these signals with unprecedented accuracy under a second, uh, which of course is important if you want intuitive and normalized wheelchair control. Yes. So maybe you can give an example of a person using this um, app, using this device, so that it, uh, our listeners could really visualize how all this would be happening. Sure, sure. Yeah, I get it. It's a little, it's a little hard without the without some imagery. So I'll do my best to explain how the device works. Um, so um, as you know, every two hours, every two to three hours, patients who are completely paralyzed have to tilt the wheelchair completely back to to relieve pressure related injuries. And so I'll give you an example on how they can do this specific task with Neuralis. So Neuralis itself is a is a headband. Think a headband any girl would wear, but it goes around the back of your head and it contains the chips and the electrodes. Now that patient also has a smartphone that's sitting right next to them on the armrest of the wheelchair. And it, that smartphone has a screen with a couple different flashing lights, but we've designed it to be subtle and um, comfortable uh, while maintaining that classification accuracy. But um, basically, you know, the UI as it looks now, there, there's a picture of that wheelchair, uh, depending on which menu there are, which they can also toggle uh, through different menus to do different wheelchair commands like armrest or leg rest or raising the wheelchair wheelchair control it, it has full capability to do that um say they specifically want to do that task but they lean the wheelchair back they can navigate to that ui through visually evoked potentials which are all on the phone and they select that menu which is the wheelchair tilt menu and then depending on where on that wheelchair they look there's two basically there's two arrows one going forward one going back depending on how long they look at that signal for the wheelchair will tilt back 
it will simply tilt back. So, so think of a patient who is completely paralyzed, has no control of any of the four limbs, um, basically completely locked into the wheelchair. Just through subtle eye movements by glancing down at their phone, they can control their wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Will there be a possibility for people also control how the chair moves, how it navigates, or this is for now the control of lowering it down and putting it back up? So the focus has always been in the micro adjustments. If you talk, again, we talk to patients on a weekly basis with our solutions. And again, most patients do have caretakers of some kind, uh, whether that be family or, or, or a nurse or you know, a sibling, a friend. But it, it's the day-to-day things that they don't want to ask for help for because they don't want to be constantly reminded of the condition. They don't want to constantly be asking for people for help. And so it's those small adjustments throughout the day that if they can do that on their own without without much effort, without much strain, that is game changer for patients. But yes, to answer your question, they also can move the wheelchair in traditional um, forward, right, left, and, and, and reverse. So that, that also does exist. But the focus of Neuralis is the micro adjustments. Hmm. And I'm very curious, you discovered this problem also while talking to patients. Why I am asking, because usually uh, when people are talking about helping uh, people in these conditions, they're talking about really mobility, a possibility for people to move with them, uh, uh, let's say a wheelchair. Mm-hmm. And you are actually uh, talking about those micro adjustments, things that people can uh, do throughout the day, which really will provide them with more independence, which I, I personally didn't hear about yet. So how did you discover this problem and started finding solutions for it? You know, Amelia, I come from Silicon Valley, I'm from California. I was born and raised in California. And, and in Silicon Valley, when tech companies build things, there's a, there's, a, there's a popular motto, you know, build things that people want, not what you think they want. And, uh, you know, like I said earlier, talking to patients was the key from the start before we even incorporated the company or started writing the machine learning models it it, it was like seriously like honing in on what would make their life better and and when people make wheelchair solutions or assistive devices they're they're smart and talented engineers and they build what they think patients would want and what they think that would improve their lives but in most cases they don't constantly go to see patients and, and actually ask them what they want and even if they do they ask them once and they say okay i know what they want now how do you know that the solution that you built is actually addressing their problems? And so I think this is something that everyone can learn, not just people in neurotech companies or biotech companies or pharmaceutical companies, but even students and researchers alike. You really have to talk to your end users constantly. Design in health tech and in med tech has to be iterative and you have to talk to your end users, not just from like a sales and customer point of view, but also you know, we, we do these things to help these patients. So we should do what's going to help these patients, right? You'll find a remarkable number of insights when, when you talk to patients and, and you find out what bothers them and what decreases their quality of life. And you start to build a roadmap of what specific features should I build in the first product? Because you're not going to have everything everyone wants when you launch a product for the first time, but it's about getting the important things that really drive home the importance of what you're trying to build and what would actually improve the day-to-day life of the patients you're trying to serve. And then once you get that, we, we can start rolling out things that more people want. So for example, our headset doesn't help with communication if you're speech impaired. That's something uh, about 5% of the patients we talk to have that kind of condition of speech impairment. And that's something I personally, if it's 5%, business partners may not think that's important. Uh, you know, As the founder and the creator of this company and someone who works with these patients on a daily basis, I think that's important, even if it's only 5%. So that's something we roll out in a future update but making sure our device is compatible from the start. But that's what I mean. So we can talk to these patients and and engage kind of interest of what they would like, what bothers them and how we can ultimately serve them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for emphasizing this important part that uh, we need to build things that patients need, not what we think uh, they need. And I'm very curious about how did your perception of what they need change as you were communicating with the patients, as you were asking them. Yeah. So maybe you can recall before and after. How uh, was this change happening for you? 
Yeah, there was a funny discussion me and my my CTO had, our my co-founder, Synaptrix. Um, and we thought we were really clever when we were building um, the wheelchair control algorithm. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, obviously, wheelchairs should move forward and right and left and reverse and even in diagonals, ideally. But we thought we were being really clever by lowering the amount of degrees of freedom to just two directions. Because the less um, visual stimuli you have, the more accurate your model can ultimately be. So we said, let's try to get away with just two. And we did this by having the up direction to go forward and just a right roll. And we thought we were really clever. We said, if they want to go right, they can just move to the right. If they want to go reverse, they just keep going right until they reverse. If they're on the left, they just keep going in the circle until they're back to the left. And we thought we were really clever with the solution. And, and the classification speed and accuracy was incredibly high. And then we took that to patients. Every patient we talked to said it was complete nonsense. They don't want to turn right to go left. They want to turn left to go left. We're trying to replace their, their legs, their limbs. Um, and we kind of looked at ourselves, we're kind of embarrassed because, you know, as engineers and scientists, we're like, we're being really clever with this engineering and uh, we can reduce the degrees of freedom to make the system more accurate and, and quicker and so on. But that's not what patients want. That's the, they, every single patient hated it. Not a single one like that. And even, you know, we even spoke with their, their occupational therapist after, after that session and they said, yep, this is a no brainer. Patients don't want this. He, they lost control of their limbs. You can't make a solution that doesn't address that. And so we went back home and we ultimately added all, all the rest of the functionality, but that, that's an example of what you have to build what other people want, not what you think they want. That was an important lesson for us early on. What were the main challenges that you encountered while building this solution? Yeah, um, again, from the software side, dealing with machine noise and also like electrical noise from the environment, it, it, you know, maximizing signal to noise is something that all neurotech people say they know how to do really well, but I don't, I don't know if I believe them. <laughs> it's, it's a problem that plagues everyone. Everyone wants to maximize their signal to noise ratio. That's like supposed to be like the foundation of everyone's model, but I kind of realized that many of the solutions that people use just weren't capable of what we wanted to do, uh, and, and what a device like this and ultimately entails so so developing that from the start was a big challenge and through a, a few clever machine learning tricks as well as some new map we were able to solve that and that's 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 really our model saffron saffron one uh, we have plans for saffron two and three to make it multimodal meaning you know, the longer the patient wears the headset it kind of adapts to their own signatures and, and becomes stronger with each patient and the patient will have their own characterization so I think that's planned for saffron two and Saffron 3, allowing people to use an API so they can just import a model directly in their own neurotech applications. Say you want to use the Neural's headset um, for the patient to control a TV or to control a lamp or to control any Alexa smart home device or Google smart home device, thermostats or nurse aids. Uh, you know, Synaptrix, we can't build every single one of those, but we can offer an API which allows smart developers to do, to do it themselves. Um, so, you know, we, we have plans to 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 release those later on with, with updated versions of Saffron. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You also mentioned that this will be the first oh, BCI control device for a wheelchair. Yes, that uh, will be approved by FDA. So usually people face many problems uh, getting approvals for medical devices. So what is your secret? Uh, how, uh, how do you make these things happen? <laughs> uh, well, Melina, of course, we can't give our secret away, but I can tell you that that it's not easy and we have worked closely with the FDA. So Dr. Vivek Pinto is the director for medical devices at the FDA and his assistant director, Dr. Heather Dean, who is assistant director at the FDA for medical devices as well as neuromodulation that handles most of those, those pre-market approvals or de novo requests that come in for BCIs. And we work with them every week or so. Again, like we talk to patients, we also talk to regulatory authorities and see what they think about the device and safety. Um, like I said, the point isn't to try to make money or or any of that. It's really to serve patients who have been chronically underserved and unaddressed. And the FDA and the people that we work with at the medical device department know our mission and respect our mission because it aligns with theirs as well. And, you know, they've been incredibly helpful 
Um, so I, I think people who work in research or in private ventures have to develop relationships with all stakeholders, not just their own team or investors or your PI at your lab or, or your colleagues at your lab, but also people that, that might have an impact on your research or work. So regulatory authorities, patients, like I constantly, <laughs> constantly say, but really everyone, that, that, that really is the key to success. I believe. Yes, and it looks that way because I think you are making progress in a very short period of time. Um, yeah. How how long yeah. have you been working on this project already? Yeah, the, the pace has been unprecedented, according to a lot of people. Um, you know, companies like Neurable that just launched their headset yesterday, actually, which is incredibly exciting. They have been working for 10 plus years on their model. Uh, we started this last November in 2022, um, so it's been a year. With a, we we have a team of about 10 now, 10 people working on this. Strong machine learning engineers from NYU, MIT, UC Berkeley, um, who all have experience in neurotech. So you know our team kind of understands the traditional problems of neurotech already from the get go, and and kind of the need to rethink solutions from the ground up, and. Again, I have plenty of experience with clinical trials in the United States, both with Alzheimer's disease at Columbia University, NYU's medical school, and also UC Irvine. So I'm very familiar with the whole FDA process and getting regulatory approval. So what I did from the start was like, I don't want to make the product and then think about regulations and then think about Medicare and then think about getting to patients. What if we just condense the timelines into one? So we, we do everything concurrently. And that's kind of the setup we have at Synaptrix where we have a team dedicated to the device uh, run by our CTO. We have a team dedicated to FDA approval, a regulatory analyst team. We have a market team um, committed to helping with Medicare and private insurance and billing. And we have a teamwork and distribution of the device across the country. So I have everything kind of running concurrently. So then once the device is ready, everything is ready at, at the same time and everything's ready to go and patients can benefit from our work. Uh, a rapid pace instead of waiting years and years and years. Yeah, that's amazing solution. And it speaks for itself. You're already doing incredible things just after one year of work. Yeah. What yeah. helps you to keep this uh, pace? Uh, of course, you know, your plan in general, it works perfectly when you are doing many things concurrently or all the necessary things concurrently but also you're still studying mm -hmm. you uh, probably needed to learn also uh, entrepreneurship although you mentioned that you already had some experience from growing in silicon valley so how do you keep all this constant rapid pace yeah Melina, entrepreneurship is not easy i, I wake up at 9 a.m i work throughout the morning throughout the throughout the afternoon throughout the evening throughout the night and I go to sleep at about 3 a.m. and then I wake up six hours later at 9 a.m. and I do that again. So that's that's been the last year. That's the last no vacations. You know, people are going away for the holidays. I'm not, I'm staying in New York City at our lab working. Pe people have to kind of understand that, especially in in the medical device world, any any industry that's so heavily regulated, that entrepreneurship is always going to be a struggle. We, you know, you're not going to have the resources that big companies have. You're not going to have the big team sizes or, or the large engineering department uh, or people to help with really anything. And so you're going to have to learn everything yourself. I only learned how to code a few years ago. You know, I, I said, I want to build great computer interfaces. I have to learn to code. So I taught myself everything, data structures and algorithms and, and how to code in Python and C. And then I learned machine learning. I, I started with a, small, a few small projects with PyTorch and I started working with MRI segmentation and uh, yeah, you, know, you see, you have to learn. You, you, we don't know what we don't know. And I'm not an expert. I'm 21 years old. I have plenty of more to learn, not only in the scientific world, but also in the entrepreneurship world. Like, I didn't know anything about how to get a company incorporated in the United States. I didn't know how to, why you need lawyers or NDAs or, or invention assignments or how to deal with the FDA at the, at the front or how to get things billed by Medicare or all these all these things that are important in in our world as entrepreneurs, like you have to learn everything or how to do payroll or how to do HR stuff or how to mount uh, an income balance sheet. Or, or I didn't know how to do any of these things a few years ago, but slowly, slowly you have to learn. You go to every class, you talk to everyone you can talk to. Um, you read as much as you can and, and you don't take any shortcuts. That's really important. I, I think a lot of people 
you know, especially because I'm from Silicon Valley in California, people love the idea of being a founder and a CEO of their own company. And they get in this trap where they just delegate things to other people. And yes, delegation is important and you don't want to micromanage your team, but it's also really important to have a clear understanding of the industry and your product, what you're trying to ultimately get out to end users. And there's no shortcuts in that. You have to do the work yourself at the end of the day. And um, what motivates me is patients. I, and I work at NYU's medical school. I, I see these patients, um, you know, a few days a week. And if I'm, if I ever feel like I'm in over my head or that all this hard work isn't worth it, um, the patients remind me that it is. Uh, I'm really proud of my team and what we've built so far. And uh, you know, as long as people don't take shortcuts, I, I think honestly anything is possible. Yeah, and uh, when you're talking about taking shortcuts, can you maybe clarify what what do you mean by that? And maybe some examples of um, taking shortcuts versus not taking it. How would it look like in uh, the situation like yours? Yeah, so... But being here at NYU and in California, I've met a lot of founders of companies, both health tech and biotech and neurotech, that they aren't, say, technical founders per se. So they, they may get a CTO, they might contract it to someone else to build an app or to build a device. And they have no clear understanding of the, their own product, which, again, is, is a little, it's a little crazy. They have no clear understanding of the patients trying to serve because they either don't work with patients uh, you know, on a daily basis or have never worked with patients in the past and they're not technical themselves. So they're not really in charge of building their product or the device. Um, I think this is really bad for a lot of reasons. There's one company at NYU, uh, you know, I don't want to say any names, but they're building something for arthritis. And, you know, I'm not sure the founder, you know, MBA student, business student, like what do they know about, <laughs> you know, the, the specific condition they're trying to address, you know. Uh, but there's a lot of examples of these, both in California and in New York. People people want to be founders, they want to start a company, but they don't really have a clear idea of, of, of the patients they're trying to help. And when I say uh, shortcuts versus not taking a shortcuts, it, it's kind of going through that whole process that Synapse did at the start, uh, talking to patients, iterating through the design and the engineering, not only with your own team in-house, but, but again, your end users is very important. Yes. So to have an understanding of the whole process, at least partially, and then, um, of course, you can bring people on board who will be working on uh, these areas, but as a CEO, you will still know everything, how it should be going, and you can understand at least on the basic level of what's going on, and maybe even on a deeper level. level. Yeah. It depends on how. how that, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I'll give you an example. Like, I self-taught myself coding and machine learning. I have a very good uh, ground of what has to be done on that, on that front, but I am not an expert in artificial learning, intelligence, or deep learning, like my CTO or some of my other team members from Berkeley or MIT are. But if I open the code base for Saffron or Neuralis and they scroll to any part of that code, I can tell you what it does. And, and that's, that's really important. Do I personally know how to set up artificial intelligence, deep learning networks for EEG denoising in the cool map that my team's developed? I didn't do that, right? But but can I put systems in place where I am aware of every single part of the organization, both with the product and otherwise? Absolutely. And I think every founder, and CEO, or leader has to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much for this example. And uh, you also mentioned that you taught yourself a lot. Uh, and uh, you gave some examples. Many of our listeners uh, who want to get into the field of brain-computer interfaces, and uh, uh, many of our listeners are thinking about building products that will be helping people. Mm -hmm. uh, they're asking where to start. They might have a background in engineering or in computer science. They're uh, saying, okay, how do I start this journey? Yeah. What would you, re you recommend? Yeah, so we we live in a world where internet access and access to YouTube and other teaching tools are just free and available. You really have to just put your mind to it. You know, for, with people with engineering who want to get into neurotech, I do get this question a lot at NYU uh, from other students as well as researchers. I always recommend them to just buy the basic, um, you know, bio signaling pack from OpenBCI. It's a great company actually also based here in New York City. Um, they sell a very a nice a cheap chip, a, a VCI chip and some electrodes and a headband. 
and, and it's like four hundred dollars and uh you can get that you learn matlab or python and you can start playing around with with uh, the brain computer interfaces it's, it's a great way to start i think that's how most people get started in neurotech these days if, if you talk to students from berkeley or nyu or in, in boston at harvard or mit it's you know they get that um the starter kit from open bci and um, they start playing around with it and they start doing the code themselves and um yeah you know, i know a lot of people personally that that will say they, they got into neurotech because of open bci actually when i was in 11th grade in high school I, I was doing a project at uc irvine for a little bit and they also had us try out open bci systems to get familiar with electrodes and recording and exporting that code to a computer and and, and you know playing around with that for the first time so that's how i got my start actually and i, I recommend others to do the same if, if they're looking to get to get into bcis yeah yeah absolutely i think that's the best experience you can have actually we had one podcast guest who is an artist and who is also a, a very tech savvy person and she said that her first equipment that she hacked was some device that she bought on ebay for 20 bucks and she's uh, creating interesting things with the art and music now of course she, she has more sophisticated equipment but it's all available and it's really the best thing to start with you know any uh, equipment that you can work with. Um, oh, wonderful. Uh, now, uh, of course, next question, because we're uh, on Entrepreneurial Journeys podcast, uh, you learning about entrepreneurship. How did you start? What helped you to learn the things, to lead the company? You know, entrepreneurship, as you know, is a completely different ball game than anything in life, I think. You know, here at NYU, uh, New York University, uh, I'm really lucky to have resources like the Entrepreneurial Institute. It's a small, um, basically, institute at the heart of the school that has experts who work with startups or venture firms. They're experts in, in legal matters for startups and accounting matters for startups and customer validation and interviewing patients and customers. They're, they're really experts in that and through NYU and that Entrepreneurial Institute program. Um, Synaptrix and myself have, have really been able to develop like the proper skills uh, we've needed. Um, like I said, like I have a background in clinical trials and in BCIs and Alzheimer's and science, uh, not running a company. And, and so everything was actually new to me <laughs> when I started Synaptrix. But I think if you're dead set in changing the world and, and you and you close your eyes and you think of a limitation and you say, how do I solve that limitation? And if that limitation doesn't exist, are you the person to create the solution? And if your answer is yes to all of those questions and you believe passionately in your solution, then I think as entrepreneurs, you do everything you can to learn how to do everything. You go to every talk, every lecture, you speak to anyone you can, you listen to everything you can, you read books from people who have run biotech or neurotech firms in the past, because um, you don't know what you don't know. And um, I think that's, that's really the key to being a good entrepreneur in my experience. And now talking to many people in the entrepreneurial community are those who never stop to learn. Um, you know, I, I work with founders who are 70 years old. They're doctors at Langone that want to commercialize their research. Uh, NYU Langone is our medical school and they want to commercialize their research. And they have to go through the same entrepreneurial journey that I do when I, at 21, uh, I'll be 22 soon, but they have to go through the same things. It's a di completely different skill set. But again, if you're deeply passionate about the work and your solution, and you know you are the right person to bring that solution to patients or to, or to customers, then, um, then as entrepreneurs, you never stop learning what you do to make that dream possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would be the three main things that are absolutely imperative to learn uh, to be successful entrepreneurs in neurotech? Yeah. First is to build a great team. Idea is 1%, but execution is the other 99. Um, as smart as you think you are, you don't know everything. That goes for me as well. And so building a real proper team, I think, has been the key to Synaptrix's success to get what we've done in such a short time frame. Um, build a proper team. Get really smart A-type people who believe in the solution as much as you do and who work as hard as you do. Very important. 
Um, not just, you know, starting a company with your best friends or people at your lab, but, but, but really finding people who think like you do and believe in the solution like you do. Very important. Yeah. Uh, second thing I'd say is to never stop learning. As, as I mentioned, you don't know what you don't know. Never, never stop learning from anyone you can. Read books, listen to podcasts, listen to lectures on, on YouTube, go to events in person. Very important to never stop learning. And the third is to listen to your customer, the patient, the end user, listen to what they want, their pain points, constantly iterate your, your device or your app or your product with them. Um, I think that's really the key to success in entrepreneurship and also in neurotech or biotech, really any industry. Yeah. And uh, you already talked a, a little bit and about um, never stopping learning and uh, about, of course, communication with the, um, your customers, <clears throat> your future users. Uh, now, maybe we can uh, talk a little bit about building a team. Uh, because, uh, like you said, it is very important and uh, these are not your uh, loved ones or your family or your friends. Uh, how did you do it? How mm -hmm. did you build this team that was so successful mm -hmm. so far working together? Yeah, well, definitely. No family, no friends. That's from the start. Yeah. Like I said, I work from 9 a.m. and I sleep at 3 a.m. That's that 18-hour workday. Obviously, I, I eat food. and uh, yeah, but. It, you know, generally family and friends don't want to do that with you at all seven days of a week, all 52 uh, weeks of the year. Um, you got to find people with that same work ethic. There's no shortcuts to entrepreneurship. You cannot just work nine to five or part time on a venture. It really has to be your full blood and sweat and, and your entire soul. You got to find people who have the same work ethic as you. Uh, but actually, importantly, uh, who believe in the solution as much as you. And, and I'll kind of give you an example. I think the best thing I ever did as a leader is to bring the team to see patients themselves. Now, I'll tell you what I mean by that. My team is filled with incredible engineers with backgrounds in AI and machine learning and industrial design, and all the different kinds of engineers and electrical engineers. Uh, but they've actually never seen patients. It was the, you know, or worked in hospitals. They're they're great engineers on their own. And so I took them to Columbia University with one of our mentors, Dr. David Zabel, at his occupational therapy clinic. And uh, we saw patients. I had them sit in wheelchairs and they moved the wheelchairs and they tilted it back and they spoke to doctors and, and they spoke to everyone. And uh, ever since that day, the, the quality of work that comes out of my team is exponentially higher. When people realize the impact of the work they're doing, they, they become deeply invested in the solution and want to be part of that. And as a startup, we can't pay people industry rates, especially for the, the work hours they're being expected to. But actually, we don't even have to ask. They just do it they, because they, they they physically see the impact of, of their work. When you're in a, you know, AI or ML engineer, you're in your roof code. You know, it's a little depressing at times. And, and so to take the trip to the hospital, I think that was the best thing I, I ever did. Yeah. Instead of just me going there, uh, taking the whole team, very important. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, how did you assemble your team? Where did you find those passionate people? Uh, how did you motivate them uh, uh, before they saw the patients to join you? Yeah, so our team is about to 10 to 12 people at this point. It's full of machine learning and artificial intelligence engineers, uh, electrical engineers for the wheelchair integrations. We have industrial designers for the actual headset market and regulatory analyst for, for taking care of the FDA and Medicare and insurance uh, and growth analysts. So we, we have a very diverse team and you're absolutely right. Building that from the ground up was not easy. And you don't just get all 10 or 12 of those people right from, from the, from the get-go. So I started with the technical co-founder. I think that's really important. I said no family or friends, but this, this is my roommate who, who is a good friend, but he is exactly like me. He works as hard as I do. We sleep the same crazy hours. and. He believes in the solution as much as I do. Kind of an instrumental from the start uh, in building Saffron, our, our, our model, and then now ideating it to Neuralis. Um, kind of realized that the, the, the pace of the work is outgrowing just us two. And so, you know, in March, we start to get more people. So coding a, a model like Saffron was too much work for just the two of us. So we got two more uh, engineers from Berkeley, UC Berkeley, who specialize in neurotech and specialize in machine learning for neurotech. Uh, interesting, there's a club in UC Berkeley called Neurotech at Berkeley. This is a 
very popular club for uh, engineers who want to get started in biotech and neurotech. Very, very smart people at that club. So I looked at everyone in the club and I said, I want these two people. And I made it my mission to get those two people. Um, they said no at first because Berkeley is competitive. It's difficult. They have a lot of work. They're working on the projects. Um, but I knew I wanted those two. And now they're founding, uh, you know, founding members of Synaptrix. Um, so at that point, that's all for Saffron. We now have a total of four people on the team, including me. I said, okay, we're going to start working on the headset design because it's going to be completely new, never been done before. We need some purpose-built headset that patients would actually want to use. Something that's even a little fashionable, maybe. Right. That's, that's important to make your device desirable for patients to use. So I got a incredible senior industrial designer here in New York City. Her name is Awasada. Um, has, has has built medical devices in the past for the Alzheimer's Association as well as for Colgate Palmotive. And I got her two more industrial designers. So we have a team of three industrial designers working on the headset. And I got them going. I said, whatever you need, I'll take care of it. Go talk to patients. Go talk to, uh, you know, uh, material suppliers and find the best cushion, you know, the best fabric for the cushion and the best plastic when we start 3D printing the device. Do whatever you need, but keep talking to patients. So I let them go do their thing. And electrical engineers, I started to find. So I started building up the team, you know, just from scratch, from the ground up. Whatever we saw we needed, what we didn't personally have expertise in, me or my co-founder, we got people to, to fill that gap in. And I think that's, that's an important like self-recognition uh, to know that you may not have certain expertise in certain fields. Like, I don't know how to 3D mold plastic and, and design medical devices that have actually been used by patients. You know, So I'll find an industrial designer who has worked for years in that industry, actually prototyping and creating physical devices um, then you, you kind of understand that you don't know everything, but get people on board that do know those things. It's really important as an entrepreneur. Uh, and our team is incredible, 10 to 12 people, where it is now, and, and I'm really proud of the progress. Uh, really getting what we've done in a year, a year and a half is remarkable. <laughs> Yeah, it's unbelievable. Absolutely. Yes, very remarkable. Uh, how do you motivate people to join you? Like you said, it's competitive. Yes, you are inviting really very high quality specialists. Yeah, yeah. Yes. How how do you how do you do it? I, I sell them the dream, Melina. I, I you know, so there's five point four million patients in the US that are paralyzed uh, and needs are unmet. I like, I don't want to keep saying that I, I talk to patients and I talk to end users, but really I take them to the hospital. I say, look at that patient. They have eye gaze, that, that computer vision system. There's a bulky monitor in their face and there's cameras everywhere. Do you think that patient's happy? And they'll tell me, Are they? no, they're not happy. And I said, so help me make a better solution. And that's, <laughs> that's worked really well. Pa people want to see the impact of their work, you know, and I think our industry, neurotech, but biotech, and medtech, and health tech, whatever you want to call it, in, in general, has, has the ability to have the most profound impact on, on patients' lives, especially when you make a really targeted therapeutic or device that, that specifically addresses what, what they want. And uh, engineers know that, that they want to be part of projects that have impact. And too much in the AI world are, are the push for like language models or vision models or music models, which are cool and they're very much needed. But, you know, if you're a talented engineer at Berkeley, you don't want to just be coding chat GPT. <laughs> you know, that's cool. It's very cool tech. It's needed, but that's not exciting for, for, for these people. But making a physical medical device that allows patients to move a wheelchair through brain activity, that's pretty cool. And so it's been challenging but ultimately we've been successful in getting very smart people on board and to help us with our goal absolutely and the next question of course in every startup uh, there is a need uh, for funding how do you solve this uh, problem yeah it's very difficult so Synaptrix is actually we're actually currently uh, raising a pre-seed round um but before this for the last year um, listen you either have to bootstrap the venture yourself, pay for things yourself, or apply for research grants. So we've been very lucky here at NYU. They support research of all kinds, 
of all disciplines. So I kind of went to the school and I said, can I have a few thousand dollars that let me buy some chips and electrodes? Me and my roommate want to work on something really cool. And we believe it has incredible potential. Well, you gave us a few thousand dollars. And they said, sure. But, I mean, a little bit of arguing later, they said, sure. And they gave me a thousand, a few thousand dollars. And we went and we bought chips and electrodes and, and we started coding the initial prototype for Saffron. Yeah, research grants um, are a great way to go if you need money early on. They don't take equity. Um, normally, they just want you to publish a paper or present at a conference. And that's something I would do regardless of the money, you know? So so that that's a great resource I recommend people to discover for themselves, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, now, the name of the company, Synaptrix, what does it mean? Yes, I personally love the name. <laughs> But, you know, synapses in the brain, Synaptrix. Um, it's, a, it's a cool name, actually. It's funny, at the lab at, at the medical school, we use this MRI software called MRTrix, mm -hmm. uh, MRTrix 3. Oh. It's, a, it's a way for you to visualize, like, like tracks, certain tracks, so like white matter tracks. Specifically, we use uh, we we image for white matter tracks near um, 80 risk regions, uh, Alzheimer's risk regions near um, lateral ventricles, hippocampus, that kind of thing. So we use that software called MRTrix, and I like Synaptrix. So <laughs> <laughs> it kind of comes it comes from that same same idea. Okay, very good. And now I'm very curious about any role models uh, that you have in the field of neurotech um, are there any companies that you keep as an example of, of what you want to achieve or how to do things or um, how to develop in neurotech industry yeah i don't want to keep talking about open bci but i really love how they've set up their company over the last 10 years Um, you know, they have incredible ambitions now. They've just launched a few new things. Um, but they kind of started as this like small company with a Kickstarter and they wanted to build a cool chip that allows people to, to, to import data to a computer from electrodes. And they built this from Kickstarter, you know, crowdsourcing. And now I think the team's like 30 to 40 full-time people and they're building full VR headsets, like a personal computer that senses. It's incredible. Um, so I, I think the CEO of the company, Connor Russimo, uh, not sure how you pronounce his last name, but I, I think he's been incredible to look up to just how he brought his own company in the last 10 years and how he's taken the success year by year and, um, and grow from there. Uh, definitely someone to look up to. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, amazing company. I agree. And uh, what innovations in uh, neurotech or in general in tech industry uh, motivate you and maybe give you some ideas that you want to implement? Yeah, I think the, th the cool thing about neurotech is everyone kind of has their own angle. Like there's invasive neurotech, as you know, but also non-invasive. People like to say minimally invasive. It's still invasive, but it's okay. We'll say minimally invasive. Like, okay, Neuralink, they want to put a chip in some people's brain. They want to do surgery. Synchron, they want to put a BCI through, I think, your artery, and it goes through your brain, and it kind of sits above the blood-brain barrier in, a, in some blood vessel. Um, cool, right? Great. Some people use EEGs. Uh, I know this company called Forest Neurotech wants to use a, it's like ultrasound, I think it is. Uh, so it's remarkable. I, I, I think everyone is kind of, attracted to that romantic idea of taking signals from your brain and manipulating the world around you. At its core, it's very impractical, but there's something inherently romantic about that idea. And people have many different ways of how they want to do that. Synaptrix uses EGs, but other people might implant a Utah array or, or a special electrode or Uh, you know, an in-house build. I, Precision Neuroscience, this company in Texas has this thing called a layer seven cortical interface. Incredible, a small slit. You make a slit in your brain and they can pass this thing in. It sits on the top of the brain and incredibly high bandwidth um, electrode. And so they have, they have an, everyone has their own idea on, on how they can make progress in this field. And what we've learned is there's no right or wrong answers. It's act, it's just your execution. So if you have an idea and a solution you think will work, then make it, create it. Yeah, and get it into hands of people that can use it. 
Um, that's that's what I love so much about neurotech is everyone has their own way of doing things and there's no wrong answers. You know, just use your imagination, let yourself get carried away and, and you'll find something that works. Yeah. And of course, we have right now an explosion of AIs. How does it help or doesn't help your company? Uh, what uh, solutions do you feel um, can be uh, significant contributors to the product uh, you are developing? Uh, and also, yeah. of course, how do you see the future of uh, possible merge? Uh, no, not possible. It's already happening. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. But that uh, marriage between in neurotechnologies and AIs? Yeah, it's a great question. AI is instrumental to our success at Synaptrix and instrumental to the success of most neurotech companies at this point. Uh, what AI essentially is, it just allows you to hyper-optimize something that you want to extract from the data or on uh, extract so denoising. Uh, it can really help optimize denoising. If there's a specific signal, E300, visually low potential, motor imagery, they signal, it can really capture that intent and optimize that. So I'll kind of give you an example. When I was in 11th grade, and this is at UC Irvine, where I was playing around with that open BCI, you know, starter pack with the little chip and the electrodes, um, I built a basic SSVP system, uh, but I, I didn't use any machine learning or AI because I didn't know what that was at the time when I was younger. So it was like mean, median mode, min, max. <laughs> It worked, but uh, so my my classification success rate was 41%. That's actually just worse than flipping a coin. So now at Synaptrix, our classification success rate is 99.7% with the AI that our team's built. Um, so this is not something for, for people to be scared about. There's a lot of people are scared about AI and where that leads us uh, as people in the world, uh, in every industry, but Actually, it allows you to to really hyper optimize any task you wanted to do, um, and you're already seeing that kind of ship out in 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 EEG detection models, and now what we're doing at Snaptrix. It would not be possible without without AI. Yeah. How do you see the future of uh, this development? Um, AI is uh, accompanying. Neurotech and specifically brain computer interfacing. Where are we heading uh, with this? Yeah, so what, what really allows AI to be so successful, especially in recent years, is how cheap compute has gotten for training models. Um, it is incredibly cheap <laughs> to train AI model these days. And we only expect that AI models get stronger and larger. Uh, we can we we're able to put more parameters uh, into our model as that training gets even cheaper and even cheaper. Companies like Google and Amazon ha ha have done incredible work in, in creating data centers uh, with massive amounts of GPUs that, that allow anyone around the world to train their own models, whether that be for uh, for language prediction, image, video, in our case, uh, EEGs and, and brain data. But you know, that tech and, and that architecture is just going to get more and more accessible to, to more and more people. And it's really exciting. Absolutely. What are your next steps? What are your future plans? Currently, my future plans are just to build out Synaptrix and, and to finish the Neuralis headset. Uh, with a patient device like this, it's so important to get it right. Uh, I really believe there aren't second chances when it comes to something like this. It can't be unsafe and it has to work properly 100% of the time. And so that's what I'm really focused on and pushing the entire team to making sure that's that's going to be the outcome. Uh, and yeah, we, we, we want Neuralis to be available by 2025. Um, Q1 2025, we, we want it to be everything to be done, at the, everything with the FDA, with insurances, uh, both Medicare at the government level, but also private insurance. We, we want that to be set up. So so I'm really like pushing hard to get to get that ready. I, I don't want this to come out in seven or 10 years. I want this to come out in the, in a year. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, with your speed, I think that's absolutely possible. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, my next question is about your leadership style. So you, you mentioned a couple of times, you know, pushing people, but uh, I'm sure uh, you, you have a very uh, nice atmosphere in your startup because otherwise mm -hmm. you wouldn't be so successful. So how do you find that middle ground uh, between really ensuring that you Yes, we are working at the right speed. We are doing everything we need, but also maintaining 
meaning the feeling that everybody belongs and wants to work on the project. Yeah, you know, especially when you're building something new, right? Um, we're not just building an app or a calendar or something, you know, when you're building something really new, like a, a new medical device, um, people, different people, they come from different backgrounds, they have different ideas. Um, and so it's really important to foster a culture where when people share those ideas, they aren't shot down because they're a, a junior member or a senior member. It doesn't matter. And so like Synaptrix, like we have, you know, we have, we have really open communication with everyone. So like an intern, we have a few interns. They call me sometimes. They, they just call me, <laughs> which is great. Call me. We'll talk about the problem. If they have any problem with what they're working on, regulatory problem, engineering problem, uh, we can talk about it and, and there's no wrong answers. You know, uh, importantly, I think if you want to maintain a good environment at a startup or any company, you must show the team the impact of their work. Engineering it's, can be difficult. So uh, when you're coding something eight hours a day in a room, in a dark room on your desk for eight hours a day, it can be a little depressing. And, and over days, weeks and months, you can really lose the, the, the bigger picture of like what you're actually doing there. And so like I said, I, I, sometimes I bring the team to the hospital and patients and they can see the impact of the work. It's really important. And, and I think you can do that in every industry and just not just neurotech or biotech, but really get your team talking to customers and to users, in our case, patients, and show them the impact of your work. Uh, interestingly, like a lot of people like to schedule meetings. A lot of <laughs> you, you don't have to do that. Uh, I, you know, I'm again from Silicon Valley, we believe in two things called a maker schedule and the managerial schedule. So if you look at my calendar, 30 minute meetings book the entirety of the day, you know, there's like no time to breathe. But when you have a software engineer, you don't want them to be coding for an hour in the middle of a meeting and then coding for like two hours in a meeting, you want them to be coding for six plus hours straight, say, for example. And so it's it's taking care of kind of that back work that allows our engineers to do the great engineering they love um, and not be bogged down by managerial tasks or by legal things. Or like we take, so uh, you know, in the United States, well, you have to file something on 83B form, for example. That just means like in the future, if the company is successful, you, you know, the stock that they got for joining us won't be taxed. That's an important thing. Sometimes people forget it. It's it's their own responsibility. We take care of all that kind of for all of our team members for free just because I believe it's the right thing to do. That's just an example. We 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 take care of legal matters, we take care of managerial matters for everyone on our team. And that kind of environment where you know that the people next to you, but also people in administration have your back and support you kind of like a family. That's super important. Yes, absolutely. So how do you uh, keep everybody informed about things that are going on? How do you keep communication um, if you are not mm -hmm. having those meetings that, of course, are very annoying very often? But what do you do instead? Yeah, well, we have a Slack channel. Uh, yeah, of course, we have a Slack channel. We send emails. Uh, we do have a, a meeting once every two weeks, but we don't have like daily, daily meetings that constantly bug people. We we really allow them to just make and to build. Um, it's very important. You, I mean, people th would think that was that would be obvious. It's you look at most companies. It's not how they run things. I, I think you have smart people. I got smart people on board. Let's just let them build and let's just let them create. I don't have to interfere with that. Too often, I think founders micromanage their teams. And if you've ever worked for a boss that micromanages you, you know how frustrating that can be. And so kind of getting that culture in your company early that you're not going to do that and you're going to let people be great engineers and just create is very important and very helpful. Yeah. And of course, again, there is that balance about uh, really letting them be creative, but still delivering on on time, yes, mm -hmm. keeping certain deadlines. Hundred percent. We we make it very clear week to week or whatever the project is or the task is um, that there are certain deliverables that have to be met by a certain time. Uh, how how kind of works? We have a senior member for each department, so uh, you know our CTO takes care of the software for Saffron. We have a senior industrial designer that manages that team, a senior electrical engineer that manages their team, senior analyst that manages the regulatory team. So we've kind of built up hierarchically. And um, it, they make it very clear what the deliverables are, what's expected from, from the start, actually. So it's never been a problem uh, for the last year and a half. So 
Uh, what qualities uh, are you looking for uh, when people want to join your team? Curiosity, for sure. You know, when you work in neurotech, it's a lot that's unknown, a lot that's new from every company in neurotech. So do they have that capability to, to, to learn and the curiosity to try new things? You know, one of our engineers actually spent the entirety of yesterday trying to optimize one specific part of Saffron. This, the detail doesn't matter, but he tried like 30 different things. Um, no one asked him to do that. He, he didn't find anything. We, we didn't fix the problem. But, you know, the point is that you, you, you find people that, that are like the iterative process of engineering and the cure. What if I try this? What happens? What if I try this? What happens? What if I change this? What happens? Kind of like experimentation in the lab, you know? Yeah. And people who believe in the solution, I, I've said this multiple times, but that's really important. When people know, see, and understand the impact of their work and what they're creating, you, you can see the quality of the work increases exponentially. And so that's never going to happen if you hire someone on the team who, who doesn't believe in the work. Meaning if you're not passionate about neurotech or biotech or helping patients, you probably shouldn't be there, right? So th those are definitely important qualities to look for. Yeah. So what would you recommend to people who might want to approach you and ask about the possibility to work with you? Uh, what should they keep in mind? What qualities um, should they have? Yeah. yeah. Our, our team predominantly comes from NYU, MIT, and Berkeley, but that's not by design. We, we don't actually look at anyone's resume or photos when when we hire them what, what we look for is evidence of exceptional ability uh, actually one of the people we just got on he's from the university of maryland he's an immigrant from india and he's doing his master's program at uh, at a small school from he comes from a small community in india but we spoke to him and it was clear he thought completely different uh, than the 80 other people we interviewed for that position it's an industrial design position and he thought completely different. Um, he saw the world differently. He had this innate curiosity. Um, and he, he also had a track record of building really impressive things as personal projects, meaning it's not for class. It's not because a professor asked you or your mentor, or your PI asked you at your lab. You said, this is, this would be really cool if I made it. And then you made it. And then it goes into your like catalog of, you know, personal projects. And that kind of thing shows not only me, but other recruiters you may talk to for other for other jobs, other companies that you do have that engineering mindset and you do have some evidence of exceptional ability that that you are different from people who go to MIT or Berkeley or Caltech or Stanford, uh, which a lot of our applicants come from. So that's very important. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you very much for mentioning that it's really uh, not... Um, that important where you are coming from, but what you are bringing yeah. and that different yeah. um, uh, motivation, actually. Uh, yes, those self-prepared uh, mm -hmm. projects are showing me, uh, a motivation from from a person. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, now, another question is, what would be the three main things you want to avoid? Maybe making mistakes. Uh, three mis mistakes that you want to avoid making in your startup? Yeah, I, I think about this a lot, especially at night. Like, say, like three years from now, I'm with my parents and they're like, oh, Synaptrix failed because X, Y, or Z. And I, I kind of try and, and think of every reason it could possibly fail from the product being bad to there not being product market fit, no distribution, customers don't buy it it doesn't pass regulatory approval it doesn't you know insurance don't cover the device so everything i can think of and like this is like sometimes like i don't sleep because <laughs> i just lay in bed thinking of all you know, every reason it could fail and and i, I kind of write it on my phone and then i put safeguards in place so those things don't happen you know because that's like my worst fear if like three years from now that the, the company does fail and three years from now i'm sitting somewhere and people said why did your startup fail and i said the startup failed because i didn't the product wasn't good. The startup failed because we couldn't get cleared by the FDA. These are all things that have solutions, you know? So why wait until it's too late? Create safeguards from the start so those things don't happen. So build a great team to build a great product. Understand how the FDA guidelines work. Understand how medical devices are built by insurance. Understand how they're distributed to patients in all 50 states in the United States. Understand how after your successful analysis, how that can go to Europe. 
and to, to Asia and to South America. So we've thought of everything because it's irresponsible not to. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's ir, it's irresponsible to find out when it's too late. Um, I'll give you an example. There's a there's a VC in New York that asked 200 startup founders that had failed why they had failed. And did you know that 36% of them said that they failed because they didn't have product market fit, meaning they started a company, they invested money and time to build it. And then they realized 36% of them realized that there was no customer for the product. I mean, so th these are, you know, these are all things that, that can be mitigated from the start. You can talk to customers, you can talk to patients, or you, you can talk to FDA consultants or Medicare people or insurance people or engineer. You, you can talk, you can put safeguards in place. So it's not too late. Uh, and that that's your responsibility as an entrepreneur, a hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear that you are making sure that these things don't happen um, to, to, to your startup and your product. Um, uh, now, if we're speaking about the future, uh, we know that uh, neural technologies are developing uh, in general technologies, uh, computer sciences, um, also solutions are developing. And uh, uh, possible solutions for the same neurological disorders uh, that uh, you are trying to re remediate uh, might look completely different in, let's say, uh, 20, even 50 years from now. How would you like, uh, how would you want to see uh, these solutions, let's say, 50 years from now? How do you think they might uh, differ from what you are offering at this moment? I think the future of neurotechnology is something we call mechanical interneurons. And let me explain what this is. Um, think of the electrodes that companies like Neuralink or Synchron or Precision Neuroscience are implanting. These are, these are electrodes that don't just measure local field potentials like EEGs, but are literally measuring the exact action potential of the neuron they target. Say we get and, and they can read and send signals as well. And say we got something like that, that we could create a mesh for, that we create over the entire brain, like a lattice of all of these thin electrodes. And then we can implant them in, in different layers, different cortical layers. And so we have a complete understanding of what's happening in almost every neuron, every part of the brain. And we can send and receive signals at a high bandwidth with a model that's probably optimized by AI, right? You could cure most neurological diseases, in my opinion, with something like that. And I, I think companies like Neuralink have that ultimate ambition in 40, 50 years. It's very early what they have right now, but the idea the, the idea of a mechanical interneuron to, to, to replace real cells that have been damaged and create a link between two healthy cells, if the cell in the middle is damaged or a tract in the middle is damaged, to create an interneuron that can bridge that gap both in the brain, but also optic chiasm, for example, M many places or in the spine, uh, many, many places where that can make a profound impact on most neurological diseases. That, in my opinion, is the future of neurotech. And um, though it would require surgery, I think would make every other company completely obsolete. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, now, uh, can you tell our listeners how to find information about you, your product, and uh, how to connect with you? Yeah, I, I recommend LinkedIn is the best. Uh, my name is uh, Arian Govillet. Contact me on LinkedIn. We have a website, synaptrics-labs.com. We post updates about our team, about our technologies that we're developing, um, and that has all the contact information there. Thank you. And as we are already ending our podcast, is there anything you would like to tell our listeners, share anything? Um, uh, I think, you know, people who are listening to this come from a variety of different backgrounds, different countries, different levels of experience, industry and academia. Uh, but I, I'd say, importantly, we do this uh, because we want to help other people. And so I'd say if, if you could take anything away from me, it would be to really listen to your patients and create solutions that they want and that would enhance their everyday life. And I think if you can do that, however you do that, I think you'd be a really successful person, um, both spiritually and, uh, of course, 
in our world as well. So, thank you, thank you very much, Arian. Uh, it was a great, great pleasure to uh, have you on our podcast. I wish you and your company all possible success, and I'm looking forward in 2025 uh, to uh, seeing your product uh, and how it is helping uh, people, and hopefully to have you again on our podcast already to give us an update. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been a great, um, great evening speaking with you, of course. Dear Neuro Careers podcast listeners, thank you for joining us on this incredible journey into the entrepreneurial world of neuroscience and neurotechnologies. I hope you've been inspired by the stories of those who are turning groundbreaking ideas into impactful realities. If you are looking for more guidance on succeeding in your careers, book a free consultation with me, your podcast host, Dr. K, at the Institute of Neuro Approaches. So, what are you waiting for? Let's navigate the path to success in the world of neuro careers and make the impossible possible together.